everybody. I am so excited by my guest today. Graham Mack is a multi-award winning voice actor. He has worked in radio and TV in the UK and Australia and has more than 200 audiobooks out there. I'm also pleased to call him a friend and a colleague. We worked on four of my books together and an audio project for YouTube. Graham, thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy. Yeah, it's great. It's great to see you. And you're looking so well, too. And you're, you're wearing just a little that because shirt. of the shirt. It's yeah, that's, that's it's great. I mean, you know, that's my team. That's my hometown. You've even got the liver bird on there, which is the emblem of the team. And we're doing great, too. We we won on the weekend. We're top of the table and we're playing in Europe tomorrow night against Bayer Leverkusen. Le Leverkusen, I think it is. German team. Yeah. So we're doing real good. All right. It's good to hear. All right. So launching into this, we want to talk a little bit about the audiobook world, mostly for first-time authors who are thinking about having an audiobook created, but we might add some little tips at the end, so stay tuned for people who are interested in getting into the narration business. So, Graham, can you share first a little bit about your work and how you got into what you're doing now? Okay. Well, a little bit about the work is I record audiobooks and produce them too for authors all over the world, including the United States, including Florida, the state <laughs> you happen to be in. But yeah, all over the United States, Canada, Ireland, China, Portugal. I think that's about it. Yeah. And they sell all over the world. I'm, I'm selling in Germany and France this month for some reason. I think it might be people learning English. They listen. I know people listen to audiobooks and read along a book to help them learn English. So I, yeah. either that or it's English speaking people that live in France and Germany. Or you're just really good at what you do. And now everyone knows your name. Have you gotten to go to a lot of these places that you record for? Let's see. Uh, well, I've been, a lot of them I've been to previously, but I've not been to them since I've recorded. I'm trying to think. No, I haven't. I haven't, but uh, I'll get there. I'll get around. I'll get around to wherever yeah. you are. We'll have to meet. I mean, we've met up in London when you came here. Yeah. So it probably is my turn to go and visit you. Yeah, Absolutely. But eventually I will. I'll give you yeah. the tour. Come before uh, how did I get in? <laughs> how did I get into it? I was, well, I was a, a radio presenter and program director on radio stations, starting out in Australia and then all over the UK. And eventually I became the program director of a radio station in London. And this is now 2020 and it's February 2020 and I get fired, which isn't usual, which sounds pretty drastic, but isn't usually a big deal. It's more of an occupational hazard. Most radio stations I've worked for have eventually fired me uh, for one reason or another. Usually ownership change, management change is sometimes my own fault, but <laughs> it, it's just it's just what happens. And it's not a big deal. You just move on to another town. And I thought that was what was going to happen in London. I had a nice severance package, so I wasn't particularly bothered. It's happened lots of times before. Only this was February 2020, and I don't know if you're a history buff, uh, but uh, <laughs> within a few weeks of that happening, the world went into lockdown. And so now nobody is interviewing for jobs. No radio station even knows what the future's going to be. Nobody's taking any risks. Nobody's hiring anybody. I'm in big trouble. And we were two years into a big fat mortgage and uh, things, uh, and I can't even, so I, I suddenly had to work out how do I earn a living from home? And I Googled a few things and discovered audiobook narration. And I thought, oh, never done that, but it can't be that hard. So <laughs> I, I started doing it and I, you know, I was doing auditions and I started getting the jobs and I started working with authors and before I knew it, I'd done 50 books out of my wardrobe and was doing quite well at it, enough to buy this purpose-built studio that um, a, an organization from Yorkshire came down and built here in our in our two-bedroom flat in, in, in the spare bedroom. So from then on, it's just got uh, busier and busier, and I've worked with people from all over the world, like I say, and I now work with uh, Tanta Audio, who are a division of recorded books, which is the biggest publisher of audiobooks in the world. And I'm regularly 
I think I've got three of theirs on the go right now of the 17 I'm working on. Uh, <laughs> I work on multiple books at a time. So, yeah, so that's basically the story. And I've also, you know, been nominated for you for a few awards and I and I've and I've won a few as well, which is it's really nice. And uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. I would not go back to radio. I as you can, as you probably gathered earlier on, I'm not the greatest employee <laughs> and so uh, to be able to work from home with people remotely is just perfect for me. I live the lifestyle of an author, but, you know, I have things to do, deadlines that I have to keep to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are, but I don't have to write anything. <laughs> so it's like cheating and, uh, and it's great. Uh, and I would never go back to radio now. I really, it would really have to be something sensational to tempt me back. But I think this is it for me now. I was going to say it's it's not easy um, because you bring the stories to life with your with your voice work. And when I first hired you for my first book, The Data Collectors, you said you took on about four books at a time. Yeah. Now now yeah. we're up to seventeen. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is this is the most I've ever had. I I think I remember saying to you that nine was a lot. Um, yeah. six or seven is manageable with 17 is a bit silly, but luckily the deadlines are all different and they go, you know, well into December. So we're recording this now in at November the 4th. So, you know, I've got a couple of months to get them all done. Yeah. And when I hired you, I know I had specific things that I wanted the narrator to have, whether it was a, a man or a woman, I didn't know who I was going to hire at the time, but I wanted them to get some of the subtle comedy, which you did. I wanted it to be a pleasant voice that someone can listen to, which you have. So I kind of, as I'm listening and I had John, my husband, listen with me and he's like, oh, he's got that. It's got that off your list. So far, this guy, you know, meets all the requirements. Let's work together. And it worked out really, really well. But could you share for somebody who's looking for a narrator, what questions should they ask? What should they look for when hiring someone? Well, if you've if you've written it, you know what the vibe of the thing is. And so you want someone who just gets that across and gets it. And, you know, when I started, I didn't know whether I was any good or not. I was just, and I had no experience and no training in it. And I was just doing it the way I thought I would like to hear an audio book. In fact, I don't think I'd even listen to that. I listened to an audio book. It was back in when it was book on tape about <laughs> negotiating so that I could get more money out of radio. I don't think I've ever even listened to a to a, a fiction audio book certainly i don't so i didn't don't know anything about it so which, which might have turned out to be to my advantage and i didn't know what other i know now because i listen i listen to people now to see what people are doing to see if i can nick a few ideas <laughs> and um i i found that a lot of narrators it was almost like they weren't from what i've listened to were weren't they couldn't see they couldn't see what was on the page and turn it into something real and there was an author i worked with once and i got the audition and i said oh just as a matter of interest why did you choose me and she said it was one thing she said the there was a scene where somebody was in, walked into the kitchen and then you know the the copy on the page said and he shouted do you want to go out tonight and she said you automatically did it as if you were shouting, do you want to go out tonight? She said, so many of them did the audition and the person would go, do you want to go out tonight? And, yeah. and it, and it was that. So just, just, I think small things like that can help bring a book to life when you understand what's happening in the scene. And so that you can play it that way. Cause you know, it is acting, even it's though like I don't consider myself an actual actor. I think an act actor is a much more noble profession. I mean, I don't even have to learn lines. So I, to, to, to describe myself as an actor is probably a bit cheeky, but I think that that is it. And I don't know whether that comes from the years I used to sing in a band where when you've got to sing a song, you've got to understand the story of the song to yeah. get the emotion across. And I don't know if it comes from that, or whether it comes from all the years in radio where, you know, you, you know, I recorded, you know, thousands of radio commercials, especially when I was in Australia, where, you know, the DJs <laughs> record all the commercials. They don't hire actors to do commercials on very small stations uh, in small towns. So I don't know whether that helped or what, but, 
Yeah. So you, but the question is, is what should authors be looking for? You've got to find somebody that is true to the story and makes the characters sound kind of like you had an idea. And if you didn't have an idea, they made a bold enough choice that you like what they did with the character. And I think you should also look for someone that you can work with. I know that's going to be harder to find out because if someone's difficult to work with or stuck in a rut of how they think it should go, it's like, you know, there's a lady I'm working with now and she's great. Where is she? She's somewhere in the States. In fact, I don't know where she is. I've, I've only just started working with her. And, you know, she sent me some notes and then she said at the end of it, what do you think? And I went, well, I'll tell you what I think. But first of all, you're the boss on this job. <laughs> you're going to get what you want. Yeah. But here's what I think. And then I told her and we, we ended up so in, in between. So you, you should you've got to work with someone over a long period of time. You know, you know, a 10 or an 18 hour book is not unusual when when, you know, it's about nine thousand three hundred words. I usually think think it's about 9,000 words for the pace I read at is an hour. So if you think of how many words in your book, if you, you, you're you going to work with this person for, you know, a couple of weeks at least, yeah. um, and things are going to go backwards and forwards, you also want to be able to keep an eye on it as it's, as it's growing. You don't want them to give you the finished thing at the end and you've got 18 hours worth to go through to check that it's right. You know, I like to do them in chunks. Um, I do the first 15 minutes, then, then the first hour and then do them in two hour chunks like that. And, uh, just to make sure that, that everything's right. So yeah, find someone, you can find someone who'll bring the story to life, uh, find someone who will be able to get the characters across, you know, the way you want them and someone who, if they're not right, you can tell them, you know what, that character's all wrong. They're, they're, they're too flamboyant or they're too quiet or they're too reserved or they're too angry or they're nicer than that. So that, and that, and then notice whether the the narrator responds to that and and sorts it out and does it a different way for you. Yeah, because yeah. you've got to remember, that. you're the boss. You know, even if you've yeah. never done, if you've never turned your work into an audio book before, you're still the boss on the job. You call the shots because it's your book. When it's all said and done, you're the one that's that's um, got the name on the written by section. Yeah. There's two points I have to make here as as a book coach. And as somebody who works in the mental health space, I would argue you also have the keen ability to take other perspectives. You have empathy, whether you, you know, I know it's weird to be talking about empathy in a narrator, but for you to be able to get in the head of the author, to get into the characters, and as you said, when you, with singing, get into the story, not everybody can do that. So to have that ability is takes a level of emotional intelligence in addition to all the other skills that you're bringing. And I also would say as a book coach and working with authors who sometimes they don't know their characters, you know, and okay. they don't have them well-developed and I'll, and I'll, I'll say gently, but why should I care? Like, I want to care if something bad happens <laughs> to this character, but right now, if they die, I don't care, which is terrible <laughs> right. to say, but so in a way, in your, you really are bringing the characters to life because they might not even know if it's a first time author. They might, but they, you know, they might yeah. need help kind of figuring it out. Um, so why should they do an audiobook? What can you tell me a little bit about the trends in the field? Well, audiobooks is the fastest growing sector in publishing. Last year, U.S. revenues. I'm reading this, so don't think I've That's memorized fine. No, this. That's fine. Last year, U.S. revenues reached two billion dollars. That's wow. two billion just for audiobooks, and it was a nine percent increase from the previous year. I I think that's down to my personal opinion in why audiobooks are just exploding this way, is because we are now used to hearing more spoken word personal content, like you know podcasting. So yeah. people have gone, well, podcasting is a thing. Well, audiobooks is still like it's it's a personal thing for you that you listen to on your own mostly. Audiobooks is like that. And I think that's part of the reason why now, and you know, also the technology is so much more portable than having to whack a cassette in a machine or a CD or, or something. But it's the fastest growing publish uh, sector in publishing. So if you're in publishing, if you're putting a book out, why why not take advantage of that and at least try 
and have an audio book version of your book. There's an author I work with in Wales. I think I forgot Wales as a country. Um, <laughs> and I've done a series. Is it about 13 in the series I've done for him? A uh, Goblin Summoner is the series. And he basically says, if you're writing books and you're not turning them into audio books, you're leaving money on the table. Yeah. Now, here's a very high selling books, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's another it's another part of of getting the work out there. Some people prefer audio books. Some people like to read along with them. If nothing else, at least you can say, oh, yeah, this one's being turned into an audio book. But it is the fastest growing sector in publishing. So, you know, why not why not get with it and, and become part of that as well? And from a marketing perspective, you want to be inclusive. Now, I live in Florida, and we have a vast older population, and maybe they're they're reading an ebook and they're enlarging the font, but maybe they have trouble with vision, and so it's mm -hmm. easier to listen. Or if somebody is still commuting to work, to listen. So to have it in the different formats, you want to market. It's the same material, but you're marketing it in as many ways as possible. So it seems mm -hmm. like it would be um, a no-brainer if someone can budget for it because, you know, yeah. it, it it's uh, publishing a book in all its forms is not not easy. It's not always inexpensive. Um, but if you're going to do it, do it right. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you if you know that the book is going to sell and you can communicate that to the narrator that you choose that the book is going to sell, there is a way of doing it without paying for it, which is a, a thing called royalty share, which instead of paying the narrator a fee, to narrate your book, you give them half of the book royalties. So it's not what it is, the system that you and I know, which is ACX, mm -hmm. which is the, I think it stands for Audiobook Content Exchange. I think that's what it stands for anyway. It's owned by Amazon. Well, it's owned by Audible and Audible is owned by Amazon. So it's the big one. And they pay a royalty of 40% from it's not like after, it's 40% off the price of the book. I don't know about in your country, but in my country, books okay. and audio books are not taxed. There's no sales tax on them. So if a book sells for $20, you know, you get 40% of that. Every, of, you get 40% of $20 every time somebody clicks and downloads the book. Yeah. And with um, royalty share, you split that. So you get 20% each. Okay. So. And you don't pay the you don't pay the narrator up up front. So if you can convince the narrator that your book will sell, <laughs> then a narrator may well go for a royalty share deal, and so you don't pay them any anything up front. I mean, in the long run, it's probably a bad deal for the author if it does sell, <laughs> because you would it would have been cheaper. Yeah. In the short term, you know, and and I say that because you know the there are royalty share books I've done now that have paid me many, many, many times what it would have cost them if they'd paid me the hourly yeah. rate to um, to produce the book. So that's that's something worth thinking about if cash flow is a problem mm -hmm. and you can convince the narrator you choose that the book will sell and it's worth their while doing it as a royalty share deal through ACX. Other people have, other organizations have a royalty share, but I don't know how they all work, but that's how ACX is works. Yeah. And I can do, a, probably will do another whole video on options for sharing audiobooks because now I'm sharing the data collectors that we did for Amazon exclusively. Now I'm doing non-exclusive and putting them on YouTube and finding another way to, to enhance the audience. So um, story for another time. We yeah. talked a little bit about it, uh, how the process works. So yes. somebody hires you and says, "Let's let's go, let's work together." How does the process? Well, the, work? the first thing, the, well, the first thing is an audition. You you'll put the you'll put the work out. You'll find a section of your book that you think will demonstrate the narrator's ability to narrate the whole book, or you can cherry pick and put different pieces from the book. You don't have to do like a, an actual chapter. You could do like a couple of paragraphs from one chapter. If there's a different kind of scene or if there's, you know, a lot of the times if there's a battle scene or something emotional, they'll put that in and then they'll put a love scene in and then they'll put something that's just basic description um, uh, from the narrator and then they'll mix them in so they get a, a good idea. But please, please, <laughs> if you're going to do that, 
don't make them too long. I've, I did last week, I did an audition and it was 20 minutes long. Now you're not telling me it takes 20 minutes to decide whether this guy's right. If you're still listening 20 minutes in and you're not sure, he's probably not the guy or girl for you. You know, just if you can keep them down to, I think the limit on ACX is three pages, but so like many 15 people. minutes, I think it was the cutoff for us. 15 minutes is fine. Yeah. yeah. But five minutes, you can probably tell, you know, whether the person's right. But anyway, this, this, the, the situation is you, you put up an audition and then you'll listen to, you know, the narrators and then you'll choose one you like. And you will agree whether you're going to do a royalty share or a per finished hour deal, or you may have already decided that and, and you've put that in your, your blurb. And so I will do the, the audition and then, um, and then, then we talk about it and we, we talk about, you know, how we want to do it. And then, as I said earlier, I'll do, once you've signed it, signed it up and th there's a deal done, then ACX will send you a contract with a deadline that you've both agreed to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and away we go and I'll do the first 15 minutes first, which you have to do as a checkpoint. And then we'll get some feedback on that. Maybe characters need to change. Maybe there's a pronunciation of a place name. Maybe that's not right. And then, uh, the first hour and then two hour chunks and you, you listen to it as you go and, and you approve it as you go. And then until it's done and that's, that's basically it, but you don't hand the whole thing over and then. You know, it's yeah. your it's your work. Your life's work is being handed over to some strange person in another country with a weird voice and a funny accent and see if they can sort it out for you. No, it's, no, <laughs> it's, it's backwards and forwards as many times as you like. Yeah. And I prefer to have things in email too. I mean, you can call, you you can, you know, do it on the phone and that, but that, that, that doesn't always work as well as having it in email where it's all written down and you can see um what yeah. the feedback like was. i would say to you hey i think i heard like a bit of static at 27.13 sure. and then you just go mm -hmm. in and trim it so that people yeah, exactly. can like pinpoint um and i feel like people should know because this happens to writers as well that just because it's 20 minutes to produce or 15 minutes to have a sample it takes yes. you longer to figure out the characters figure out the story oh, sure. produce it and, and like, master like it. 20 minute that 20 minute audition i think that that took me over two hours to do yeah. because there were multiple characters. I was trying out different voices to see which ones would work well. And you've got to make sure that like the, the most important thing is that see when you write the book, you haven't written it to be read out loud. So you will, a character will start talking. Maybe we'll say a paragraph and then it'll go said Dave. Well, the listener has to know that that's Dave before they get to said right. Dave. So you have, they have to be unique characters and they have to, you have to be able to tell them apart from each other without the said Dave and he said, and without the name being in there, you, that's where you want to get to once they've listened for a little bit. And, uh, and, and so, so when you're working on auditions, you have to be aware of that, that they all, that they sound different enough that the listener can instantly tell who's speaking yeah. straight away. And, you know, I'll go back and I listen back on an audition. I'll listen back to every word. I'll go through every line and I'll listen again and see if the inflection's really right, if that's really how they would react in that situation. And yeah, I'll be very, very fussy with it. Yeah. So it does, it takes a long time to, yeah. to, to get the audition right. Because I have to know though, you know, if I didn't get the job, I have to go, well, I gave it my best shot. It just yeah. might, it just mustn't be what they're looking for. I can't, I, I don't want to regret going like, I should have gone back over that because I don't think I never thought that bloke was quite right. You know, so I always have to <laughs> yeah. you know, know that, that I, I could, gave it the best, uh, the best shot I could or, you know, and making those bold decisions sometimes on characters that they give you no explanation for. Uh, or you can put explanations in there, but sometimes you get no explanation. It's just in the writing. You have to find it in the in the script, in the in the manuscript. You have to find what it is. And, and then, you know, there, there was. There was an there was an author I had. Um, I've done many books with him, children's books, and there was a particular character, and the way he was written, it sounded, it sounded one way to me, and I did it that way, and then he said, "No, he's still not right. That's not that's not him. He's more." So, well, you know, give me an idea. And then I looked at it again and looked at it from a different point of view and read it differently. 
And there was a TV comedian in this country in the 60s called Tony Hancock. And it looked like a Tony Hancock script. And then I thought, Tony, so I just did Tony Hancock and, it, and I <laughs> sent it to him out of desperation. He went, perfect, got it. He never knew I was doing Tony Hancock, but sometimes there's just a, there's just a key to it that you need yeah. that, and, and it drops in the place and then bang, you're away and you've got it. And it's exactly what they were looking for. 